It really seemed to start working for me was when I got away from kind of your traditional delt exercises of an overhead press and like a dumbbell lateral raise. So I want to kick things off much earlier in your journey around 2005 when you were building up rep points on bodybuilding.com forums under the username Quelly following guys like Straight Flex Lee Norton. Can you talk about a highlight and a low light during that time period from either a lifting or nutrition standpoint? Yeah, so 2005 at this point I had been lifting for a year and I had you know, the fact that I was on the forums in bodybuilding.com is kind of the equivalent of like going down in modern times, the the rabbit hole of uh, like Reddit, or sorry, Reddit, following people on YouTube, you know, getting your Instagram all curated to fitness content producers. Um, and it's only, a, I would say it's only a low point in retrospect when I, when I think about it. I remember specifically being in the Perry workout uh, section of the nutrition forums where a, another uh, probably relatively well-known person was one of the moderators. So straight flex Lane Norton. He's a moderator on bodybuilding.com forum. So it was Alan Aragon at the yeah. time. And I was trying to pin down Alan. And I know how annoying this was because I had now have people do this with me. <laughs> um, basically ignoring anything he said, except I just wanted him to tell me exactly the optimal amount of uh, carbohydrate that I need to have pre and post workout. And he would say things like, well, you know, it's only so glycogen depleting, you're probably getting enough in the day, it's only acute data, yada, 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 you know, kind of, you could see some of his early thoughts that eventually led to some of his peri workout writings later that kind of de-emphasized and point out the limitations of the data. And I was like, sick, cool, right. Anyway, so what, 40 grams, <laughs> you know, and, um, and he, I eventually, like, basically just uh, neuroticism bullied him into telling me a number that was probably fine. And I was like, cool, that is the answer and optimal. So that was probably my, that tells you something about my, my mentality at that time and how different it is to today. Um, I was purely there to get science-based information to um, be a better athlete. Because in 2005, I was trying to be as big as possible. I knew I had the goal of... Um, eventually competing maybe and uh, just wanted to, to tick every box times 10. Um, I would say a high point though would have been when I found Father Flex um, on the, the bodybuilding.com forums and for those who don't know that's Alberto Nunez and we started talking I found out he was living in Hayward. I was uh, I'm from Oakland originally but I was living at this time um, in Sacramento which was just, you know, an hour, hour and a half from where he was. And uh, we started following each other. And we decided in the same year, 2007, to actually compete. And we did the same first show together, the Silver and Black Muscle Classic, which is named because it's supposedly a show sponsored by the Raiders in Oakland. Mm -hmm. So Silver and Black, back when they were still the Oakland Raiders. And uh, there was not a Raider to be seen. And I'm sure sometime in the late 90s or early 90s, maybe they said yes to the INBA. Yeah, sure, we'll sponsor the show and gave them a check. And forever since then, it's been the, the silver and black uh, marketed based upon the Raiders that, uh, you know, doesn't even make sense anymore. And they, anyway, very small mom and pop show. But I got to meet Alberto, who ended up becoming uh, like a brother to me and an eventual business partner and still to this day, um, just from the forums. And that was one of the first times I saw just how, um, amazing the connections you could form through lifting are so uh not very specific to training or nutrition but kind of bigger picture um without that meeting i don't think 3d muscle journey as we know it today would exist yeah so it's still like an important watershed moment oh absolutely yeah. awesome. awesome so i want to move forward i want to talk about the muscle and strength training period which i believe is ultimately about priorities we mm. spend so much time talking about volume exercise selection progression and ultimately what's optimal. What I find most interesting is adherence, which is at the base, meaning it's the foundation of all program and program design. You mentioned it must be realistic, enjoyable, and flexible. Can you explain this layer? And do you have any tips to help people figure out what they can adhere to long-term? Absolutely, yeah. So no, I, I think you accurately characterize the muscle and strength pyramid as being all about hierarchies. 
And um, that's so important these days because the, the problems that we have in this space today are no longer an issue of information access, um, but an issue of information overload. So being able to order and understand things in relevance to in relation to one another and in, re, in relevance to you and knowing where to put your energy, what are the quote unquote big rocks versus pebbles versus sand uh, is, is what that's all about. And at the base of all of it, like you accurately said, is adherence. And a very common thing that people have is before they fully understand how to program or adapt programs to their own situation, they will just take a program that's on Reddit that has good reviews. Uh, and where they often will go wrong, and this is the really practical application, is they won't consider necessarily what are the constraints of their lives right now in terms of their, literally the amount of time they can spend in the gym, um, how many days a week they can train, uh, what their current recuperative capacities are, what they're adapted to, um, what their prior injury history is, and what their equipment access is. And they'll just go, all right, I'm going to take the program that has the same goal as my goal and that is the highest rated and most recommended on Reddit, um, and then I'll do it. I think it's great to just go and do a program, but if you have you know, two kids, a busy job, and you have perhaps three days for an hour apiece where you can go train, and you kind of shoehorn a four or five day per week, which is most of the programs you'll find online, quote unquote optimal program, the likelihood that you will succeed with that is actually poorer and even though on paper you might get, let's, let's hypothetically say it is a better program than anything you could do in those three hours that you actually truly have stress-free and clear, um, it will be a poorer outcome to, rather than what is on paper. So I think the mistake most people make is they, they start with shopping rather than assessing you know, what's going on in their lives. So the recommendation I would make is assess what you can do first and then only try to optimize within the constraints of that. Because you can do a lot with three hours, especially if you're relatively early on in your journey, um, knowing just how much the initial amounts of volume and hard work and compound exercises can go a long way when you're not, you know, well adapted to training yet, and you're you're making these, you know, fantastic honeymoon newbie newbie gains newbie gains phases are, are great. So essentially, it is really the matter a matter of all right, let me come to the table knowing what I can do first. Okay, I got three hours. This is my goal. Here's my equipment. Um, and then considering that, regardless of how grass, how green the grass might look on the other side of the fence, what do I select? And that is one of the early stumbling blocks that a lot of people, uh, you know, trip over. And it kind of promotes this black and white thinking like you you got five days per week to train. Damn it, I only did four again you know what, I, I, I quote unquote missed a gym session or getting in that gym session caused me stress somewhere else. And then you get this general sense of, oh, this isn't sustainable. But perhaps you would have had a very different experience if you just committed to that uh, Monday, Tuesday, Saturday, whatever your schedule is uh, set up and went really hard just within those constraints. And you'd be very surprised how good it could be, how much intent um, you could bring to a quote unquote suboptimal program and get a much better outcome than uh, bringing stress to a quote-unquote optimal program. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Something I like to do is kind of like inversion as a thinking process. So I'll, you know, think of a more difficult time than maybe when I have motivation to do something and then think, why would I fail? And then I'll assess all the reasons why I might fail and then realize that those are kind of roadblocks in my program and I need to solve for it. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Me at my, my, my weakest, or if you want to use that framing, or, or most human, maybe, or most stressed, or, or least time available, uh, how, is, how is that version of Varun or Eric going to be able to handle um, what I'm planning to do? Because if and when you do stumble, it's going to probably be in those times. So if you can uh, pre-plan for those points, then you're probably going to be able to handle anything else that's in between where you're at today and, and those rough spots. So I think that's a fantastic uh, practice and a way of framing it. And do you feel like you think through the lens of adherence in aspects of your life outside of lifting? And if you do, do you have maybe an example of something you were able to foresee that you wouldn't adhere to long-term? 
Yeah, no, honestly, a consistent problem in my life that I have as an adult tried to get better at is that I always have had my plate just a little bit too full. And then invariably something comes that you're not anticipating. And it's kind of like, you know, it's like when you watch those shows of like, you know, a variety show and they got the juggler who comes on and he's like, he's up to eight balls. And you can tell it's taking every ounce of his focus to juggle eight balls in the air. And, um, and it, it's, it's as if I was a juggler and I knew I could juggle eight balls. I'm like, sweet. So that's, that's the norm. And then, you know, someone just comes in and just throws a ball and it adds to it. Um, often you drop more than one, right? So um, the, what I have needed to take from kind of the, the same philosoph- philosophy of, of adherence is that I shouldn't be juggling eight balls just because I can all the time. I should ideally be probably juggling six or, or at most seven because there always will be someone who comes in and throws a ball um, or you, you break your hand or something like that. You know, life doesn't stop for your goals. And I think... I, I've applied that to my work, my relationships, everything is just to try to only do 80% of my capacity, knowing that I'm probably going to end up overshooting that a little bit and that something else will fill up those, that 20% of time invariably and in a phasic manner. Um, and I think there are times when you can redline it um, and you can do more and you will need to do that at phases in your career when there's deadlines or, or times when it's just what the, the success of the task requires. Um, And when those times come, you will have the energy to deal with it and you'll have the ability to then stay at at six or seven balls afterwards so you can recover and you will get much more grace from the people who care about you. If you're telling them, hey, I need to juggle, to try to juggle nine balls for the next two months. But there's a a light at the end of this tunnel and uh, my apologies if I'm, you know, a little bit of a jerk or if I not able to, you know, if I forget to do this or if, if I'm not available at these times, um, that's kind of how I have to negotiate, you know, contest prep, for example, at yep. the end stage phases, when you go from leaner than anyone should reasonably try to get to, to even leaner you know, <laughs> as like a, uh, you know, a, a pro in, 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 in physique sport, for example. So, yeah, no, I, I, I could give you a billion examples from making sure that I'm, supervising my PhD and master students out here at AUT to um, how do I make sure that I'm actually recovering from the training I do while still, you know, acting and in, in, in the three companies that I'm part of, you know, mass, my books and 3d muscle journey um, or just, you know, not getting divorced. You know, we're coming up on being together for 20 years, me and my wife, and we're very right. happy. Thank you. And that, that only occurs because I make sure that there is space, time, energy, um, emotion, and, uh, and intent available for, for, for that relationship and that I remind myself of my values. So, yeah, it, it's, yeah that, that's kind of, the, I guess, the metaphor of, of juggling one or two less balls than you know you can at any given time so you can prepare for those, those balls or knives or bowling pins that life throws at you. Yeah, I've been married 12 years, so I understand that. Like, yeah. the, you can redline at times, but you got to focus on the relationship as well. One thing that I realized that I just have to reduce over the course of time to keep all the balls in there is like traveling for work. Like, I've, I'm more conscious about saying yes when I travel because when I'm doing that, it's, it's such a big gap because I'm out of the house. Oh. Especially when you got kids like you, man, like that's, that's a whole nother level. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's a really good message to anyone who's in the same kind of age bracket as us. So awesome. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw at some quotes that you've said in the past. Just give me your, your first thought as to what oh. it means. And this one's recent. If you're calling yourself an evidence-based content creator and you are not leveraging the principle of charity, that's a mark against you. We are not trying to win. We are not trying to be right. We are trying to be correct. Yeah, this one, uh, I think I think it stands on its own too, for the most part, unless you're unfamiliar with the principle of charity. And another way of framing the principle of charity, and I'll give a shout out to, uh, to Nick Tuminello on this, is uh, steel manning versus straw manning. So most people are familiar with the concept of straw manning, to attack a straw man. It's when you make a version of the argument that you're arguing against that is not the one the person is presenting, 
but it is a easier straw man. You don't have to actually face a real person. And then you can easily attack it, critique it, and it is a purposefully uncharitable take on what the person is saying to create something that's easier for you to disprove so that you win the quote-unquote debate. And yeah, in a formal debate, I do get that the, the purpose is there's actually judges and, and you're trying to win. But I think the origins of debate and discourse and uh, doing so with, with rules in an academic setting and having you know, this critical analysis and picking apart one another's ideas is incredibly value, valuable for the purpose of getting closer to the truth. Um, and because we're all human and none of us have access to all knowledge, nor do we have uh, the ability to let go of all of our biases and view things and we have things we want to be true regardless of whether they are true, no single person has access to all information, perspectives, truth, or um, interpretations that are better in different circumstances. So we are smarter collectively, but only if we are willing to play by rules that enable us to enhance one another's information. And if one person is entering into a debate with the purpose of better mutual understanding and getting closer to the truth collectively by sharing knowledge and perspectives, and the other person is there to look smart and get the easy dunk on social media to sell things, to maintain a zealotry, uh, uh, you know, fervor in their followers or to just make their ego feel better, um, or all three at the same time, um, then that is going to produce a poorer outcome for everybody. So the principle of charity is purposefully taking the strongest interpretation of what someone else is doing. Instead of creating a straw man, you're creating a steel man. So steel manning someone else's position. So you might have someone who maybe is a jerk to you and they post something and it is a, it's got grammatical errors and it's factually incorrect, but maybe you have an inkling of what they're getting at or what motivated it or how they would have said it if you were in person. And it's pretending they said that. It takes self-discipline. It is, um, you know, you have to you have to acknowledge. Okay, they got triggered and they said that, and now it's triggering me. So let me just get that out of my system, and I'll rant and rave in person to my my partner or in my head, or I'll write a response. I'll delete it, and yeah. then I'll do it again. I can't tell you how many deleted emails I have in my in my draft folder that I never sent, and I knew that I wouldn't send, but I needed to get it out of my system. And then you respond to them steel manning it, and the number of times that that has diffused a potential situation and resulted in me actually learning something and understanding their point. And also anyone who's watching getting better educated because of it is beyond the number that I can count. And I just think, man, if everyone in our industry, well, and if I really wanted to be Gandhi, like the whole world, uh, applied the principle of charity in all of their interactions in even a decently consistent manner, like 60% of the time, I think we'd have a much more productive uh, space that we were operating in and a lot more useful information and a whole lot less consternation and stress. Yeah, I think that's applicable outside of, you know, the the research world as oh, well. Yeah. So an example would be like Warren Buffett, for example, in the finance world, he's a very critical thinker. And what he likes to do if he's going long on a stock is he wants to understand what the most intelligent person thinks who has the opposite side of the story or the yes. opposite position, not so he can debate them and explain why he's right. So he can see what pieces of information he may be missing. So he can think through his decision a little bit more clear. Absolutely. It is a, I honestly, I think it's like a, the coward's way out to assume that someone else who disagrees with you is dumb. Um, it's, it's a, you don't have to actually challenge yourself and engage with differing ideas that don't support your bias. And B, it's very arrogant, you know, and arrogance really doesn't serve you. You know, it's as, as people have said, he goes the enemy, right? So, yeah. All right. Next one is think less about how to get most out of your current program cut or bulk and more about how to get the most out of your lifting career. Mm. Yeah, this one is in direct response to how often I see people trying to apply the concept of optimal to too short of time windows to the point where it is eventually suboptimal. Uh, an example would be when I get questions about rapid fat loss protocols, right? 
Um, they're asking how high to keep my protein, uh, what's the largest possible deficit I can sustain, and how would I modify my 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 training protocol because I'm going to have really low energy lethargy and I'm only eating 1,200 calories a day and I weigh 230 pounds, right? They're trying to they're they're so earlier I talked about starting with constraints that are based upon your real life and optimizing within them. This is creating a program with constraints that are suboptimal and then trying to optimize within that, but that you don't have to create, right? It comes out of the start of being impatient, right? So the the whole perspective of rapid fat loss as an as like a, a, an evidence-based perspective is what's the best way I can do something that's stupid, you know, <laughs> like basically to be harsh. And, um, and yes, it, there is a way to, to lose the most fat possible uh, in terms of a ratio of that to lean mass in a given window, but it's not necessarily the same as what's the best way to lose fat and maintain that fat loss long-term. And ostensibly most of the time, not always, I mean, maybe you want to use a rapid fat loss protocol because you're eight weeks out from a photo shoot, you're a fitness model, and you need 15 weeks to get as lean as you would normally. And you're like, listen, I'm not going to be at my best. I might lose a little bit of muscle, but I got to get paid. This is my job, and I got eight weeks to do it. Is it possible? Fair enough. But 90% of the time, it is someone who is motivated, fed up, and is really can't stand being in, in the body they're in and wants to change it as fast as possible. Um, and the, the behaviors are very different for someone who wants to permanently change their body composition than someone who wants to change it acutely. Uh, that's been shown empirically and anecdotally. Anyone who's been a trainer or who's been through the weight loss process themselves, most people end up losing the same fat multiple times. Um, and effectively losing that fat very efficiently is, is not the solution. So the perspective that I'm suggesting is instead of thinking about an acute bulk or an acute cut and how to get the most out of that, how do we get the most out of our career? Which is then thinking about successive periods in this context of gaining phases and cutting phases. How do they link together? What leads to long-term sustainable changes? And what can I adhere to, to go back to what we talked about before? And while it is true that it is important to break up big goals into smaller goals, you do that in a manner so that they link to each other and support each other to get to that career outcome. You don't just kind of think in eight-week blocks with no perspective as to the long haul. Um, that's not how athletes do their best four years from now in the Olympics. They start with, okay, how do I get to the Olympics in four years, and how do I build up to that? Not, I need to be an Olympian. Olympians train really hard all the time. The next eight weeks need to be brutal. And then they get hurt in 24 weeks, and they're like, oh, well, I still have three and a half years of training and I'm injured already. Like that's not helping me. So same kind of perspective. Um, and it's, it's incredibly common, just short-term thinking. And a lot of the times it, it comes from a mismatch between passion and education and also commitment. A lot of the times people, if you really ask them, like, are you comfortable with the idea of training and changing your nutrition for the rest of your life forever? As a personal trainer, I used to like talk to my clients about that. Like, I'm here, I'm gonna like I want to work hard, we're gonna work four days a week. And I go, All right, so we're training really hard four days per week. You're monitoring your nutrition, you're doing all these things. Could you see yourself doing this forever? And they're like, honestly, no. Like, this is to get to an outcome. And I go, Okay, that's fine, but we need to find something that you're willing to do forever, or I'll see you in a couple of years repeating the same process. And that can take multiple attempts, but Eventually, you have to find what it is that you're willing to completely modify your life towards. And that can be done in stages. You know, it could be as simple as I'm going to try to eat more fruits and vegetables now, but it might eventually be, you know, thinking about and monitoring your satiety levels after meals and going to the gym, now, maybe not four days a week, but twice a week regularly and getting a Fitbit and making sure you get at least 6,000 steps by 3 p.m in the day because then you know you'll at least get somewhere in a range that's 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 good for health and, and fitness later so it, it can look like a lot of different things but ultimately the philosophy that underlies all of those potential logistical decisions is am i focused on not just what i'm doing right now but how it fits into a broad picture of where i want to eventually be permanently 
Do you think that short-term thinking has gotten worse over the course of the time, or is that just a product of myself viewing it from this moment, and that's more how human nature has always been? I know you might not have the data on there, but just thoughts on that. Yeah, this would be completely just me speculating. I think uh, I think it is a, a feed-forward mechanism. Like you know, social media would not have algorithms that reward short-term thinking and shorter attention spans if it weren't for the fact that we had short-term thinking and short yeah. attention spans, right? So, you know, these algorithms were not, you know, they didn't come from Skynet and just like this this AI that popped out of out of nowhere. Um, you know, all the things that are in social media yeah. are there to try to perpetuate the, the utility to the business that owns that social media company. It's to keep you on the app, to keep you keep you engaged, to keep you interested. So the things that give us those clicks and dopamine hits are what we're seeing, you know? I don't think it always necessarily matches up perfectly, but that is the goal of the people involved. So the fact that we're seeing more short form content, we're seeing more people who seem to be a little bit more ADHD in society, and we're seeing, you know, a lot of things that are, are frustrating to people from our generation. It's like, well, you you can't read a blog post. Like you just, you can't get through 1500 words. Like that's, that's not on the table for you anymore. Cool. Um, you know, that stuff is, it seems like it's worse now, but I, I don't like, I don't actually know. Like what I would want to say here, let me tell you this. If I wanted to answer that question with data, I would want to take a look at blogs generally. Are they less consumed today than they were before? Have they changed? Mm. Because it may be that people who weren't reading blogs then are still not reading blogs today but they are on social media more. So social media is growing and it's just, there's only going to be a certain amount of people in society who like long form content period. Um, sure. And at the same time to play devil's advocate to myself, we think of podcasts as a modern phenomenon that are very popular in a modern form, but they've been around for a long time. You know, like uh, the podcast format is decades old, you know, Howard, Howard Stern, like stuff like that. Absolutely. You know, so people are, are interested in, in longer form content and even educational and, and things like that. Like, you know, not everybody listens to NPR. I'm trying to think of like, what's the most bland long form kind of old school version of a, of a podcast. So not, but, but man, I, I know that um, podcasts have popped off in the last two decades, but they've always been there. And the fact that they're more popular now indicates that certain types of long form content people do like, um, I don't think Joe Rogan is a particularly intellectual based podcast, but they're three hours long sometimes, you know, and people listen to it. So I don't know if the appetite has gone down for longer form content and needing to have a shorter attention span, but certainly things that capture shorter attention spans and reward short term thinking are on the rise. And I think that's in all of us. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think I could have a separate one hour conversation about working at Google and how the algorithms work, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. Yeah. You're the uh, expert there, brother. So, um, so recently I spoke with Steve Hall and he mentioned that he loved the control aspect of bodybuilding. I heard you mention that when you got into lifting, you were in the air force and you were looking for an outlet and that you liked control. So I'm curious, what aspects of control do you love about bodybuilding? Yeah, it is um, basically a microcosm of life where you are getting to pull all the levers and see results and changes in it. And it's something where you get to feel like, yeah, this is going like I'm I have agency here. And I think humans crave agency. Um, we think about self-determination theory and all of our theories of, you know, cross-culturally validated ways that humans find meaning and, and prefer to be alive. Uh, and they always include some degree of agency and self-determination. So at the time when I was in the Air Force, I was in a, a situation where I could not change something that was bad. Um, and for respect to the people involved, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But essentially, I couldn't take leave because of the type of assignment I had. And I was across the country um, from a place where... I would prefer to have been and prefer to be doing other things and focused on something. Um, so having this period of time where I could really just, you know, 
get out negative emotions, you know, through physical activity and a little bit of masochism and training was one piece of it. But the other piece was that element of control. I had a workout schedule. I had an eating schedule. I had certain outcomes. I was looking at my scale weight and I was progressing these numbers. And I could see that unlike this other situation I was in where I knew what I wanted to do, but I couldn't do it here. I could make a decision and see that it had an impact on an outcome. And that is something that I think um, gives people a sense of relief in times or in situations where they don't have that in other aspects of their lives. Um, and to get a little bit on a, on a side tangent there, this is often the environmental influences that sometimes result in people manifesting eating disorders as well. Um, there's a heavily heritable biological component to anorexia nervosa, for example. Uh, and sometimes it can manifest without any kind of negative environment uh, or trauma. But when it most consistently seems to happen is when you take someone with that biological predisposition towards it and you put them in an environment where they don't have the ability to self-determine and have agency. So just, just to kind of give a, give a parallel, and that's not to say that fitness is an eating disorder, but um, there's some interesting parallels between bodybuilding and that, and that type of environment. And I've yet to meet a bodybuilder who doesn't have elements where, even if they're relatively relaxed, laid back, and you do see a number of those people in, in bodybuilding, especially competitive bodybuilding, because there's an artistic element to it. You know, displaying the physique, posing, and, mm -hmm. and having some you know, creative expression can co-vary with these kind of uh, you know, obsessive, compulsive types of approaches. So you get some very interesting personalities where you get kind of like maybe in another life they're a surfer, but they're also like weighing their food to the gram, you know? So, okay. Yeah. It, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting mixed bag of personalities, but certainly a unifying thing that occurs between uh, bodybuilders, competitive or otherwise, who are really, really on their, on, their, on their stuff and on their P's and Q's and they appreciate structure and control is that ability to have something in your life that you're the master of that you decide how it works um, and it may be because you have not had that in other elements you know steve hall for example and he's talked about this publicly so this isn't me you know putting out his business but early on in his life he got into a car accident and yeah. had some serious health concerns and revive stronger is is his message of how he came back from that through bodybuilding yeah um and i have absolutely had parallels like that in in my career and used bodybuilding as a vehicle to uh, maintain agency and to grow as a person because of what was going on outside uh, of, the, of the gym. Awesome. I'm going to move directions in a much less mindset uh, focused way. I know you did a delt Latin calf specialization in 2022. So what is your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite exercises that target either the lateral or posterior deltoid? Yeah. So the ones that really seemed to start working for me was when I got away from kind of your traditional delt exercises of an overhead press and like a dumbbell lateral raise. Like for years and years and years and years and years, it was um, overhead military press because um, I've been involved in strength sports, strongman, Olympic weightlifting. And there's something great about just pressing a barbell overhead from dead stop off a rack. Um, even though I'm not strong at it, you know, like if you compare my bench press to my overhead press, it's, it's pretty bad overhead press. Um, but as a strength enthusiast and a historian and all that stuff, I love it. Um, and it's a great exercise. Don't get me wrong. But if you're specifically someone who is narrow framed and needs to have more of a V taper and tends to have a less responsive upper body, um, there might be better ways to spend that, especially if you also have a prior neck injury and poor shoulder flexion mobility and you can't lock out your elbows and you're 41 and your name's Eric Helms. So <laughs> not to be too specific. Yeah, not specific at all. It's just totally uh, no, a no. take. Yeah, it could be anybody. Um, so, and also dumbbell lateral raises, easy thing to do. You grab and you do lateral raises and everybody says lateral raises, lateral raises, lateral raises, most important thing for, for delt development and getting those cap shoulders. Um, but as we've come to understand more and more and more is that you get a greater hypertrophy stimulus um, when you apply tension to a muscle when it's at a relatively longer length. And yeah. if we think about the biomechanics of a dumbbell lateral raise specifically, it gets harder and harder and harder as the lever arm increases. So when your arm is straight out to your side, that is when the distance of the load is furthest from the fulcrum. 
and anyone, you don't need to, you need to understand physics to understand this. Is it easier to hold the dumbbell at your side or maybe two inches from your, your hip or that same load directly out to the side like you're doing an iron cross? And the answer is it's really hard to hold it directly out to the side. So you're limited uh, by the strength in that position when you're doing a dumbbell lateral raise. And that's also the end of the range of motion where the muscle is the shortest. So you're essentially overloading the shortened position. And I've yet to meet someone who's done lateral raises and actually gotten sore from it if they're done by lateral raises, especially if they've been training for maybe more than a few weeks, to be honest. So they're not a very stimulative exercise, in my opinion. Um, I don't think they're a very good exercise. But simply switching to cables, now all of a sudden, you have a relatively even force curve, and it's hard the whole time through. Because now you're not just uh, opposing gravity. You're opposing the uh, direction of tension from the cables. And you can exaggerate that even more by doing uh, variations of cable lateral raises where you start with your arm in front of you, reaching across, Get those say, your, yeah, your opposite pocket. Or if your glutes aren't too big and juicy, behind, and you have shoulder mobility behind your back, reaching to kind of your opposite back pocket. Or even manipulating the dumbbell. So, for example, you lying on on an inclined bench, reaching across your body, so it's overloaded to the bottom. And now all of a sudden, you can get into a more stretched position and load it in that position so that it is uh, kind of the opposite in terms of the actual uh, emphasis to a traditional dumbbell lateral raise, which is harder in the shorter position and very easy, if not nothing, in the most lengthened length position because the dumbbell is directly in line with gravity straight down. So the big one I'd say for delts is uh, cross body behind the back uh, variations of cable lateral raises. And um, yeah, they, they made a pretty substantial difference when I, of course, also did them with a relatively high volume and frequency for me relative to what I did. And I would say for anyone who wants to give these a try, you don't have to do the shotgun approach of do higher volume, closer to failure, and start with this new exercise. Just take what you're currently doing and if you're doing mostly dumbbell lateral raises, just swap them to cables behind and across the body. And overhead press, it's still, it's still a great exercise. It's just that it is primarily useful for anterior delt development. And if you're doing incline, decline, dips, bench, and any, every, every press, even flies, train the anterior delts. Um, and uh, they may not really be needing that much more work. Um, and the overhead press does train the medial delt, but probably not as good as something like a cross body cable lateral raise from a stretch position. But did you do any did, better than a dumbbell, to be honest? Like a dumbbell lateral raise. Did you use any intensity techniques or just more straight sets? I have, um, but it came down more to, and I do now, but it comes down to more just to time availability. Um, so, quote unquote, intensity techniques, something like a rest pause uh, or a drop set. Um, I think they are most useful in situations where they are not going to produce a ton of cardiovascular fatigue. So if you're doing, let's say, drop sets or rest pause on a barbell squat and you're doing it in the 15 rep range, that's just a fantastic way to, uh, to die. Um, and it is very challenging. And if you actually look at what's the output of, let's say you did, you know, a series of drop sets and if we were to actually get you on a force plate and look at your impulse, which is just the force over time, it would be a lot less than if you did straight sets uh, in say like the six to eight rep range, stopping two rep shot of failure on squats. Cause that overall fatigue, the perception of fatigue and the cardiovascular fatigue is going to create so much uh, discomfort that you're going to have to end up dropping the load for non-muscular reasons. Um, so I don't actually advise quote unquote intensity techniques on like compound, especially lower body movements, um, where they are very useful though, is when you can make sure that the fatigue is going to be predominantly peripheral in the specific muscle you're training. You're, it's unlikely that doing a drop set on cable lateral raises is going to make you huff and puff to the point where that's actually constraining your ability to do work. However, um, it is likely to produce a lot, a lot of local fatigue. And this is where you can get equivalent outcomes. And there are numerous studies where they compare drop sets or rest pause sets on, like say, arm work, like bicep curls, uh, where you get similar outcomes to straight sets. It just requires a little more work. You have to roughly match the, the work 
and then you're getting the same outcome because it's not confounded by fatigue. So um, I do it from time constraints because I have to do relatively high volume to get my physique to where I want it to be these days, trying to eke out the last 5% of my potential and also being busy. So when I get down to my isolation movements for my upper body, including uh, lateral delts, I do do drop sets and rest pause more often than I just do straight sets. Okay. Uh, but it's not because they're better. Um, but it is a useful way for me to get the equivalent of three straight sets or four straight sets, which would normally take me six to 10 minutes to get, you know, one long drop set or a rest pause series done in one third that time um, and get about the same. And for those who are wondering, rough equivalents, guessing based upon the literature, let's say you do three straight sets on something. If you do uh, one top set and then three drops, probably probably equivalent. Or if you do one top set and then you do three rest pauses afterwards, probably pretty equivalent. Perfect. Thanks for uh, clarifying when to use it or not. I was definitely talking about for uh, the for the lateral raises, the cable lateral, but uh, don't want people to think, okay, well, I should you know do rest pause for heavy squats too. Yeah, that's 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 one I just like to the, the caveats I must put out there because I worry about people dying under the squat rack. So. <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw out some pictures. I'm going to put them on the screen nice. and just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Um, if there's a story or if there's something you feel like you learn from this person. Sure. Ready? Yep. It's you and Matt Ogus. Matt Ogus is the one who made me realize the power of social media and YouTube. So Matt Ogus is probably single-handedly the reason why 3D Muscle Journey accelerated maybe from 2010 to 2012 a lot faster than we otherwise would have. I think we would have eventually got there. But this was specifically Matt Ogus' 2011 season where I was also dieting. And I want to say he was a few weeks out from the Muscle Mayhem and I was a couple months out from my first show. We were at Jeff's house. That's his gym. And we did like a little YouTube channel interview. Now, the first time that I really realized the power of social media and how things were changing was he asked me because he you know, reached out via just our website. And he word of mouth. He happened to be from Sacramento. Um, we were in the local area. This is where 3DMJ was kind of popping off at the time. And he he basically just was a client. And I, you know, it's like anybody else. I wanted to work with him, help him out. He was mm -hmm. a, a young man who was missing some of the basic fundamentals of what were the determinants of success. So, for example, he was trying to like build into a uh, into a natural bodybuilding show, and he got on stage. I think at like 190 in one of his first shows. And this is a, a guy who eventually competed in the 150s. Wow! So, yeah, just not knowing how lean you need to be, or that the contest prep process is is, a, is a, an extreme fat loss phase after building, um, and then emphasizing, for example, he was just adding reps over time. Like he had like this chalkboard, and he would just take a given load and you would just, okay, I did 40 reps last time, we'll do 41 this time, we'll do 45 next time, we'll do 46. And getting to this absurd, absurd volume without having other pieces in place or focusing on progressive overload. So again, this is like 2010 era, you know, 14 years ago. And like I said, different problems then than now. Access to information then versus information overload today. So I really taught him some very basic things. You know, at the time, he kind of promoted 531 with bodybuilding accessories in in a landscape where bodybuilders just didn't even think about progressive overload. We had a, we had a, uh, a seminar and every person in the seminar, when I asked them, you know, what makes a good leg workout gave some variation on them feeling like I got hit by a truck or I can't walk. So it being hard, great, but not necessarily did I improve on the logbook. And it wasn't that that was an unknown concept. You had people like Dante Trudell talking about it or, you know, power building has been around in some form since the like 1800s. So definitely there is an, an understanding that, you know, getting stronger is part of this. But it, the mainstream bodybuilder was focused on effort and intensity in a more subjective, ambiguous manner. So Matt Ogus is simply running a 531 bodybuilding variant with the built in progression model of the, you know, the plus set that you do where you try to get stronger over time, increasing your estimated 1RM and lifting heavier. And then applying, and if it fits your macros, basic approach with a caloric deficit, 
I watched him just get diced and see just how gifted this kid was. Wow. Um, and he did very, very well in his 2011 season. And one thing he asked me was, hey, Eric, do you mind if I put my check-ins, which is just him going through the poses and telling me how the week went, on my YouTube channel? And my response was out loud was, sure, of course, no problem. And in my head was, I don't know what you're saying, but sure. <laughs> you know? So cool. he sent his first check-in to me, or maybe one of his first check-ins, and it had some absurd number of views. You know, it was a different landscape in YouTube back then, but we're talking thousands of views in an era where having 100,000 followers is more equivalent to having a million now. Yeah. So to kind of give people like the, I don't know, the, the inflation metrics on, yeah. on YouTube views. And I was like, holy shit, like this is a phenomenon. And the result of that was that we ended up having a 300 person waiting list wow. for 3DMJ by the end of 2012 because of Matt Ogus's popularizing and sharing his natural bodybuilding journey. And it was the first time I got platformed. And I'm fortunate that it happened at a time where I was just completing my master's degree. I had been competing. This is my third season. And I'd been a personal trainer or a coach for uh, the better part of six or seven years. So I was fortunately ready to have a social media explosion fall in my lap. And I was able to help platform 3DMJ. So I'm incredibly thankful for the uh, the time I got to spend mentoring Matt Ogus. And he went on to keep doing his thing. And now he's... Now he's a family man, so he's awesome. got a lot of kids, and he's not quite as active online, but it's probably for really good reasons. Awesome. Next one is uh, the old Arnold Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. Yeah, so shout out to Patrick. He is one of my uh, Air Force buddies when I first started lifting, which I mentioned earlier, and the workouts that he introduced me to were out of uh, Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. Um, and the very first workout I did with Patrick was a leg day because he wanted to basically introduce me to like the real hard training. And I want to say we did either leg press and deadlifts or squats and deadlifts. And then we had the rest of a leg workout to get through. And on my last set of 10, I did three by 10 on deadlifts with 135 pounds or 61 kilos for the non-Americans listening. I threw out my back on the last rep and I went outside and I was so fatigued that I threw up. And so that was my first experience. And I was, because of the emotional state I was in, that was actually the moment where I got bit by the iron bug. Awesome. There was something about me being able to do that and then going, no, I want more that ticked me over. And that was the start of bodybuilding, showing me how much self-efficacy I actually had, how much hard work I could produce from always seeing myself as someone who was, relatively lazy and did what was necessary to get by, but not more, um, probably mostly undiagnosed ADHD, but it, it doesn't matter. The, the point was, is, is that moment that I associated with that workout at that time was the, the spark that got me to eventually where I am today. So yeah, as much as those workouts probably aren't necessarily like perfectly optimal, they, uh, they have a special place in my heart. Awesome. Next one is, uh, you and Birdo back in the day. Yeah, so this is, I, I think this is during the competitor meeting at the Silver and Black Muscle Classic in 07. And first, dude, big props for hunting down these old ass pictures. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and I'm wearing a, uh, a hieroglyphics shirt, which for those who don't know, that's uh, Bay Area classic old school hip hop, 93 till infinity. Um, Souls of Mischief. That's right. Souls of Mischief. You got to love it. Pep Love, one of my favorite rappers. But um, anyway, that's us chilling at the Silver and Black Muscle Classic, our very first show and the first time we actually physically met each other in person. Um, I was in a really good spot to do well, and then I completely overcarbed up and covered myself in oil and didn't put on enough color. So I kind of looked like this yellow oil spill, suntan, spotlight person who didn't pose well. And Birdo did as best as he could have competing at the high 180s, low 190s, considering that he now competes as a pro at 160. <laughs> so, you know, he, uh, he, he had shape. You, you know? got to learn, right? Yeah, you got to yes. learn. Yeah, we, we both made opposite end of the spectrum errors. 
And to our credits, we uh, did very well the next season in 08. He won every single amateur show that existed in natural bodybuilding in California. And uh, I was a little bit of a late bloomer, but I eventually would do pretty well as well and correct those errors. But that was the, the, the start of us. I think this Berto will tell you this story. I think I was his first white friend. So um, it was a first for, for, for both of us in many ways. He was my first bodybuilding friend. He certainly wasn't my first uh, uh, Mexican friend. But, um, That's but yeah, so it was, it, it was a, it's a great little microcosm of how the typical circles you run in changes when you do something like lifting weights and yeah. uh the unlikely uh bromance between the two of us started there and it eventually like i said led to uh what people know as 3d muscle journey today and where we found jeff and and, and brad and then eventually the whole rest of the team awesome for the next two tell me what workout would you do if you met them in person mm. first is frank zane frank zane man um <clears throat> probably archery like because if, if if you <laughs> okay that i wasn't now, expecting that okay no this is this will sound weird so like frank zane um he has certain muscle groups that are very you know well developed and he has a great shape and a lot of it is just man he's got the, like the, the the right proportions you know he's modern steve well second era steve roos but um if you ever follow any of his content or if you read about his work or his perspective a huge aspect that he emphasizes is focus uh, mental clarity intention and one of the ways he likes to manifest that for example is actually practicing archery and being able to focus on one thing like if you go get the zane experience back in the day i'm not sure if he still does it yeah he'll take you through his workouts he'll show you his diet but he likes to talk a lot about the mental side of it um and I think, and, and it's it's one of the few, like, no shade, but when he talks about bodybuilding, he doesn't seem that interested anymore. He's not quite, like, if I could go back in time, it'd be a different answer, right? Um, but if I met modern Frank Zane, I would want to do the thing that he still seems quite passionate about, which is the, the mental aspects and elements of bodybuilding that he seemed to really uh, engage with. Okay, so, you, can go, you can go back in time. Go back in time? Yeah. Probably an upper body workout. Okay. You know, and some archery and some archery. Absolutely. All right. And the, the last one is just the whole slew of really OG bodybuilders. So I'll let you pick one of them and, and what would you train with them? All right. So there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting things going on here. So, so Bobby Pandor, which is not his real name. He has a very complicated Eastern European name, which I can't remember. Um, incredible physique in the top, right? supposedly did not train with weights him and his brother were all body weight gymnastics calisthenics stuff and his leg workouts which the, the picture doesn't show his legs he has ridiculous legs uh was him and him carrying his brother upstairs and vice versa um so that's wild max maxic and Otto arco were like muscle control guys they did a lot of like like flexing and control but also heavy lifting sigmund klein um he did a lot of Indian clubs, barbell lifting, and what was weightlifting back in the time. And he had a, a club in New York, if I recall correctly. Herman Gorner is, there's debates as to what his deadlift actually was, but it was somewhere between probably 600, 800 pounds at this time. Wow. And his body weight was somewhere between 220 and 260. There's myths and legends mixed with the actual history. Um, Fred Rowland, uh, also a muscle control guy, but also did a lot of what's called strand pulling, which is basically pulling apart these, like almost like slinkies that are tightly wound, uh, and, and then putting around your back and using it for pressing. It was like proto cable work essentially. And then of course, everybody knows Eugene Sandow. So if, if I had to choose, this is out of curiosity because I, I, I don't think anybody actually knows how much Herman Gorner actually could deadlift because there's debates around it and something in you know there wasn't consistent size plates or even implements to deadlift um like his i think one of his only verified lifts was like a 500 plus pound one hand deadlift or like finger deadlift but nonetheless ridiculous deadlifter and i would want to do a max out session on deadlifts with like calibrated plates with herman Gorner. so i would be the one person who'd know how much can this man actually deadlift is it 600 pounds 700 pounds is it 800 pounds and you know, all the above. That's awesome. 
Thanks for knowing all of them and a little story about it for you know anyone who's a historian here or wants to be. Um, so I'm going to move in another direction here. Uh, this might be a, a hard question to answer, but mm. I want you to project yourself to the age of 80. Looking back at your life, what do you want your legacy to be? I would like it to be that I gave people a perspective on lifting weights in the iron game uh, that took them down a path that led towards it being something bigger than maybe just simply changing the way they look um, and led to a lifelong appreciation for it and them understanding that some of the lessons we get from striving against the iron have inherent value and it's not just what they extract from it as far as how they look, how much stronger they get, how they do in sport, uh, or maybe how many likes they get on their picture. Um, but that they find some type of meaning from it and that it makes them a better person. And that that is not just this thing on the side that we acknowledge, but maybe a greater focus for the space as a whole is acknowledging that element and being aware of it uh, in a more intentional, vocalized way. I'd say that would be what would I would want out of all of this. Like it's easy to say something like, I want people to engage with science more often, but um, that's part of it. I would love people to take a more critical, rationally skeptic approach towards you know bodybuilding. But I think that would happen if they stuck with it long term and striving, because ultimately you can only quote unquote like caveman it for so long before you have to start using your brain to make your muscles grow. So I think people get there eventually, whether or not they acknowledge they're using a science-based approach. I think it leads towards critical thinking because it, it's, it stops unless you just start taking anabolic steroids. But uh, yeah. Awesome. I think you're well on your way. So I'm going to end today with kind of a fun question. What is your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite hip hop albums of the 90s or early 2000s? That is hard. Okay. All right. Let's go. Hard. All right. Um, one okay, so one out of the four is gonna have to be um ooh, okay. I'd say most death black on both sides. That's up there. Fantastic. Um <clears throat> Is it, is it albums or is it just people? Whatever you want. You can go people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. I'd say third eye vision hieroglyphics, and that might just be the recency bias of seeing me in that. But yeah, I, I would say either Dell the Funky Homo Sapien or Pep Love, just the work they did in the 90s and early 2000s, I thought was incredible. And with a level of uh, lyrical skill that wasn't quite as well known and popular on the West Coast even though popular is relative in the sense of underground. Um, Nas's first album, that's not quite late 90s, a little early 90s, but... Uh, Illmatic? Yeah, Illmatic is incredible. Yeah. So Illmatic, Black on both sides, and then Hieroglyphics as a whole for what they did uh, uh, on the West Coast. Um, and then I would say the... The Lyricist Lounge albums by Rockus Records, which didn't last. Apparently, they didn't take a good, good, good care of, of the artists on there. But there were very few compilation albums that really captured so many good artists from all over the place all at the same time. Where you look back and you can find, you know, Charlie Tuna from Jurassic 5 on a freestyle mm. with Cannabis, on a freestyle with Eminem, on a freestyle with... Um, I have not heard this. Oh man, the Lyricist Lounge One and Two are some of the best albums that have ever been done in hip hop. It's Sway and Tech and all the compilations and putting together and and some of the stuff from Rockus Records. They have, um, you've got like Chino XL on one track and Cool G Rap on another, and his comeback trying to hang with the the next generation. Um, you've got you've got Tech Nine showing up on random stuff. You've got EPMD. It is like I love EPMD. Yeah, it's, it's the fingers that reach beyond uh, a given region and are just basically like, hey, who are the people who are excellent MCs and how do we get them all on the same album? It's kind of like the uh, the compilation album of all compilation albums is Lyricist Lounge 1 and 2. 
some people who are unknowns and who maybe never had a career and other people who are like, oh shit, that, that's, that's Riza. You know, like there's, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. That's like, you know, old, old school Riza. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got a story here. So I don't know this is probably like 10 years ago. Um, Nas was in Toronto and I went to go see him and he did the entire Illmatic album and DJ Premier was there. That was the entire oh, concert. God. It was Nas and Lauren Hill. I left before Lauren Hill came because she came like way too late and I went mm. for that. But yeah, he just played Illmatic. DJ Premier was there. It was fantastic. Incredible. Yeah, yeah that, that, I'm sure that was one of the best experiences of, of all, all time of hip hop. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, it's hard to just pick four. I almost went with um, Life After Death by Big E or, or you know, Machiavelli, but um, there's I could make a, a list. There's too stuff. many, right? I know. There are, many. yeah. Awesome. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for your time today. Where can everyone find you? Probably the best place to find me would be 3dmusclejourney.com. Um, that is me and the, the collective that I've referred to many times. Um, we have launching points from there. If you want to get real nerdy and subscribe to my monthly research review, mass research review with other folks who, who go over like, hey, how do you understand and apply the latest research as it comes out? Or if you want to downgrade yourself of one level of constant nerdiness and just do a, like a, a one time, like, Hey, I want to, I want to just have some information, the muscle and strength pyramids. Those are in book form for both training and nutrition. We have links to that. Or if you're looking for guidance, the coaches are awesome and you can find us right there at 30 muscle journey. Or if you're like, Hey, I don't want to read all this stuff and I don't need a coach, but I do want to teach myself a lot. We have what's called the 3d MJ vault, which we have like 25 courses that are very practical applied video based primarily courses aimed at helping people become the best version of whatever their goal might be whether that's competitive or recreational bodybuilder or strength athlete so um and then if you want to follow me when i do stuff that is off my own platform and i come on lovely podcasts like this helms 3dmj on the uh the instagrams that we love love to hate and hate to love awesome thanks for your time man my pleasure thank you for having me